Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to worship this beautiful Sunday morning at the Presbyterian Church in Westfield. To those of you who are here in the sanctuary and joining us online from wherever you are, you are welcome in this place. Our church is a church of community, of family, and there are many ways in which we can connect with each other, various ministries and programs. If you are new or would like uh, more information about what is happening in the church, you can fill out one of the connect cards that is in the pew in front of you and hand it to an usher or place it in the offering plate later in the service. As well as being a family and community, we support each other through prayer. Those are prayers of concern, prayers of joy and thanksgiving, um, prayers of praise for our mutual God. Um, and we pray those together as a community. Later in the service, um, our director of music, Paul Sander, will be leading us in prayer. And if you have a prayer request that you would like added to the prayers today or to our prayer list, um, that we keep going here at the church, please feel free to fill out one of the blue slips in the pew in front of you, and an usher will come by during the first hymn to collect those and make sure that they are included in our time of prayer. We are starting a new worship series today. It is called Everything I Know I Learned in Sunday School. Um, you may have seen the fun little posters of Everything I Know I Learned in Kindergarten, like Keep Your Hands to Yourself and don't spit on people and don't eat glue. Um, those are all wonderful lessons for life, um, but we also have lessons that were learned long ago in Sunday school that we want to be reminded of and keep fresh. And so we will be having that series um, for the next four weeks. We also celebrate today in the sacrament of baptism um, of Ryan Luke Tawney, the son of Jill and Richie Tawney, which we are very excited about. As a community, let us now rise as you are able to join in our responsive call to worship. Raise your voices in response to God's goodness. Lift your hearts in sweet surrender to God's mercy. We thank you, O Lord, for hearing the prayers of our hearts. God is good. Praise be to God. God never fails. Amen. Let us join in singing hymn number 41, O Worship the King, All Glorious Above.
I would like to invite the Tommy family and Elder Bill Tittle up front. Hear the words of Jesus. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Obeying Jesus and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember with joy our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. On behalf of the session, I present Ryan Luke Tawney, son of Jill and Richard Tawney, to receive the sacrament of baptism. Do you, the parents of this child, desire your child to be baptized? If so, say, I do. I do. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach this faith to your child. If so, say, I do. I do. And for our congregation, do you as members of the Church of Christ promise to guide and nurture this child by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging him to know and follow Christ and to be a faithful member of this church? If so, say, we do. Through baptism, we enter the covenant God has established. In that covenant, God gives us new life. We are guarded from evil and nurtured by the love of God and God's people. In embracing that covenant, we choose whom we will serve by turning from evil and turning to Jesus Christ. I ask you, therefore, to reject sin, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we were baptized. Do you renounce all evil and powers in the world which defy God's righteousness and love? If so, say, I renounce them. I renounce them. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If so, say, I do. I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his words and showing his love? If you will, say, I will with God's help. Having affirmed your faith and committed promises on behalf of this child, let all those who are able rise and confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We thank you, O gracious God, for your gifts of water and the Holy Spirit. In the beginning, your spirit hovered over the dark deep. From this formless void, you brought forth light and life. By the waters of the flood, you cleansed the world and made, with Noah and his family, a new beginning for all people. In the time of Moses, you led your people out of slavery through the waters of the sea, making covenant with them in a new land. 
At the appointed time in the waters of the Jordan, when Jesus was baptized by John, you sent your spirit upon him. And now by the baptism of his death and resurrection, Christ sets us free from sin and death and opens the way to eternal life. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this water, that this child buried with Christ in his baptism may rise with him to newness of life, and being born anew of water and the Holy Spirit may remain forever in the number of your faithful children, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom you and the Holy Spirit will be all glory and honor given, now and forever. Amen. going to be my friend in this, right? We're going to get along? Okay. Ryan Luke, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O Lord, uphold Ryan by your Holy Spirit. Give him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence now and forever. Amen. Little one, for you, God created the world. Little one, for you, God came into the world in Jesus Christ, born a child of the covenant in Bethlehem. For you, little one, he told us of the love of God. For you, Jesus died, and for you, he rose from the grave. All this he did for you. Although you know none of this, we, your church, promise to continue to tell you this story as you grow so that one day you may know it and make it your own. Ryan Luke Tawney is now received into the Holy Catholic Church. Through baptism, God has made him a member of the household of God to share with us in the priesthood of Christ. Blessings upon you, little one. Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask your blessing on this child who is newly baptized into your family and all those you have called to join our community of faith. Hold them in your arms and bless them. Shine your light on the path before them and let them always feel your loving presence as they travel along the paths of life. May they always know who and whose they are. Lord, we ask your blessings on the parents, grandparents, teachers, and others who will teach Ryan about Jesus Christ. May all of these guide him with their own example of your love and always be ready to listen and comfort, to laugh and play, and to encourage and praise. Amen. Let us welcome the newest member of God's family into our beloved church family. Please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, you have known us and loved us since before we have known who you are. And you love us our entire, our entire lives throughout eternity. Help us to open our hearts and minds to the message that you have for each one of us today. Bless these words and make them yours and not mine. In your name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned, we are beginning a new scripture series, Everything I Know I Learned in Sunday School, exploring stories we've probably heard many times, but hopefully to remind us of the message and to see them in a new light. Today's reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verses 1 through 17. Hear now the word of the Lord. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you shall rest on every animal of the air and on every bird, any, every animal of the earth and on every bird of the air and everything that creeps on the ground and on all the fish of the sea. Into your hands they are delivered. 
Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And just as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life and is its blood. For your own lifeblood, I will surely require a reckoning. From every animal, I will, will require it. And from every human being, each one for the blood of another, I will require a reckoning for human life. Whoever sheds the blood of a human, by a human shall that person's blood be shed. For in his own image, God made humankind. And you, be fruitful and multiply. Abound on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The word of the Lord. Most, if not all of us, who grew up going to church and Sunday school have heard the story of Noah. The people of earth have become increasingly evil, but Noah was righteous. So God chose him, his wife, their three sons, and their wives to be the only people to survive and continue on. They built a massive ark, collected two of each animal, loaded them up, and then endured 40, 40 days and nights of rain, after which the waters dried up, they left the ark, and God sent a rainbow as a sign that humanity would never again be wiped out by a flood. We've probably done coloring pages on it or seen it on a little felt board with two-dimensional little characters. We might have watched a cartoon version or read about it in a children's Bible. But what was the message we actually took from it? Think back to when you were a child and heard the story for the first time. What did you think about it? What do you remember? Was it that God got angry with people and punished them? Did you wonder how all of those animals possibly fit on one boat? And also how bad it must have smelled? Also, why did God include mosquitoes? That's a question I have. Gonna have to wait until I meet God in person to, to figure that one out. But I think they shouldn't have been left let on the boat. Did you wonder why God chose Noah out of everyone? All of those questions that we had as children about this story are valid, and they help us get to the larger understanding of the quote-unquote moral of the story. That even though the people had turned away from God, and God was justified in what was done, ultimately God didn't completely undo the beloved creation that had been made. As W.M. Lloyd Allen puts it, God's unstoppable purpose to create a peaceful cosmos collided with God's immovable compassion for a destructive, recalcitrant humanity. I don't do big words. I shouldn't put them in my sermons. <laughs> Basically, God undid what had happened. The violence and baseness that humanity had descended into the destruction of the natural working order, including animals attacking each other and humans, the relations built between the sons of God and the daughters of earthlings, the boundaries God had put in place that were flouted at every turn. I cannot even imagine what God must have felt seeing the perfect creation that had been made with such love and attention dissolve into chaos. It would have been completely understandable if God had simply wiped the slate clean and started over. 
but God loves us too much to do that. The punishment was deserved, but we still came out of it in a place of hope. The earth was not completely destroyed, the animals survived and were able to carry on, and we, the stewards of it all, were allowed another chance to do better, to embrace our purpose and live into the belief that God has in us. God believed that we could do better and we can do better. God wanted and still wants that better for us. And even after the punishment was done, God made a promise to never do anything like it again. As a whole, and even though we are made in God's image, we tend to do things that are harmful to ourselves and to others, never quite completely learning and understanding the miracle of God's unfailing and eternal love. We squander the grace and forgiveness that God shows to us every day, even when the consequences are dire. We choose violence. We choose hatred. We choose jealousy and competitiveness. We choose stress and expectations. But in spite of all of this, God still chooses us. God is loyal to the creation no matter how disloyal we become. Us living in a world with sin is not what God intended. We made things that way and continue to make things that way. So God is forced to, stay, to change the strategy. You have the first change very early on after the first sin in the Garden of Eden. God didn't want to force humanity to toil unnecessarily or to feel shame about our existence. God didn't want to wipe out all of humanity. God didn't want to have to send Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, but God did. This promise in the story is the first example of a covenant in the Bible, and it is even more unique in terms of biblical covenants between God and humanity because it is completely one-sided. God does not ask Noah or his family to do anything in order to receive the blessings and promises of the covenant. In later covenants that God makes with people, there are stipulations and expectations on both sides. People will do X, Y, Z, and God will continue to love and care for them. And it is worth noting that people fail in their side of the covenants every single time. And even though God would be completely justified in withdrawing love and compassion, God never does. In these covenants, God chooses to limit God's power and might because of a care and love for creation. God does not wish to see us destroyed. God always keeps the future of relationships open, allowing for infinite and endless possibilities where humanity can reach back out and return to right relationship. We just have to make that choice. And throughout scripture, we see people making that choice. One of my favorite books to teach especially to teens, is the book of Judges. I did a months-long series on it at my series on it at my last church in Sunday school, and by the end, all of the kids could recite the theme, which is, and once again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. This phrase is repeated dozens and dozens of times throughout the book and sums up the choices that the Israelites made in their relationship with God. God would give them a judge, a wise person to help them follow the path that God expected and wanted for them, and things would be good for a while, perhaps even decades. But eventually, the judge would die, and then the Israelites would start making choices that were terrible. They would lose sight of God and worship idols or other gods, and they would start to live lives like the nations that were their neighbors. And so God would let their actions play out. And they were always overrun by other nations, losing in wars and being oppressed. Then eventually, they would realize the error of their ways and cry out to God in repentance, and God would come in and redeem them, enabling them to live lives that were best for them, which is what God wants for each of us, and be in right relationship with their creator once again. A new judge would come out of the midst of this situation, helping to guide them on the right path again. And as long as the judge was around, they live happily in their blessed positions as children of God. Until, of course, they would once again do evil in the eyes of the Lord. 
But God always provides the opportunity for us to choose right relationship because that is God's desire for us. As we learned in the creation stories the past two weeks, we are not an afterthought or a random occurrence that just happened in creation. We were created with a purpose by God the creator, and we must always seek to live into that purpose. And while God does allow for our choices and consequences, God never, ab God never abandons us. God's promises are the most valuable promises that have ever and will ever exist. They are not given out lightly, like a child saying that they'll promise to clean their room when they have no intention of ever doing it. Anyone who is a parent or who has ever been a teenager knows what I'm talking about. And these promises, they are not given out of deceit or in a quid pro quo exchange, as many promises are. Now, the title of my sermon today is taken from a book that was a favorite of mine as a child, A Promise is a Promise, by Robert Munch and Michael Musugak. It is a retelling of a story often told to Inuit children, a tribe of Native Alaskans, of which I am a proud descendant, and it was to warn them from going out onto the ocean ice without their parents because the evil Kalapaluit would grab children who weren't with their parents and drag them down into the depths of the sea. In the story, a girl named Alashua tells her parents she's going fishing and promises that she's gonna go to the lake, but then actually goes out to the sea ice by herself. She fishes and brings in a prize catch, but then taunts the Kalapaluit, who then try to drag her into the sea. They only let her go because she promises to bring her brothers and sisters back to the sea so that the Kualapaluit can have all of them. They let her go and she staggers home. When she finally gets there, she tells her mother and father what she had done and they tell her a promise is a promise, that she must do what she promised, that they would help her even though she had done wrong because they loved her. The God who makes promises to us is not a God who turns a blind eye to our mistakes. God doesn't comfort us and say, it's okay, don't worry about it. We are wrong in our sin. We are wrong when we go against God. We are wrong when we hurt others and hurt ourselves, even though we know better than to do all of those things. God looks at us at, as Alashua's parents looked at her and finds a way to help us. Would Alashua's parents have been justified in being angry and upset with her? Absolutely. She had not only disobeyed them and basically signed her own life away to the Kalapaluit, but she then promised all the rest of their children to the same fate. But they don't yell, they don't throw her out, they don't cast her away to her new fate. They come up with a way to save her life. And God does the same thing for us. We are so loved and cherished by God that we will never be abandoned or cast out. Would God be justified in doing this? Absolutely. But God chooses to forgive, to redeem, to save. God promises to love and care for us because that is what God does and what God is. That is God's nature and it cannot and will not be changed. No matter what humanity chooses to do, there is no sin so great or mistake so bad that God wouldn't welcome us back when we realize the error of our ways. And even in those times when we are wandering in our sinful ways, walking away from God, even pushing God away in rejection, God does not waver. We are loved no matter what. The love does not stop just because we choose not to reciprocate it. It is the truest kind of love, the agape love, the love that is everlasting and steadfast. That is the promise that God gave to Noah, and that is the promise that God gives to us every day. We can choose to behave in ways we know we shouldn't. We can choose to wander after our own versions of the call of Blewett because that seems more exciting, or we are trying to prove that we are brave and we know better, but we simply don't. We are blessed beyond imagining in this life, 
We have the ever-present guidance of the Holy Spirit working within us and around us every day. We have the grace and eternal life that is ours to receive through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we have the love and forgiveness of God who stands by us no matter what. Because a promise from God is an eternal promise that we can always rely on. Amen. morning. Our prayer is based on the prayer commonly attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make us instruments of your peace, recognizing difficult situations and how we can step up to show calmness and rationality. When there are places of unrest in the world, give us clear heads and open hearts to bring reconciliation and to provide places to listen and learn. God of love, wherever there is hatred in the world, let it be our goal to spread your love in any way that we possibly can. When it is difficult or even seemingly impossible to love from our own hearts, may we remember that you love all people unfailingly and without hesitation or prerequisite. God who reconciles, 
when we see instance of injury or offense, or when we experience it ourselves, show us how to pardon and forgive those causing the injury. Help us to be leaders in the righting of wrongs and the limiting of hurts in the world, recognizing situations where offense might occur and doing everything within our power to stop it before it happens. Steadfast God, where there is doubt in this world, whether in our own hearts or in the hearts of other people, give us the understanding and insight to have faith and to be examples of faith to those who struggle. May we always remember that doubt is not the opposite of faith, but a crucial component of living in faith. Great comforter, where there is despair and misery, fill our lives and communities with your never-ending hope and steadfast love. Give us the strength to set our own needs aside and grieve with those who grieve, to sit next to others in their darkest hours, not trying to fix anything, but simply being present in times of sorrow. We pray for Sally, who is recovering from a fall. We pray for Arthur on the loss of his five-year-old grandson, tragically in a car crash. We pray for Sonia, for people looking for work without work. We pray for Ukraine. We pray for Dominic, for Carolyn and Nancy, for Jerry and Carol experiencing health issues, for Nancy battling metastatic cancer, for Leona, for Lynn for employment, and for good family relationships. We pray for Richard, Hunter, Jennifer, Gianna, Caroline, Claire, Claudia, Cheryl, and Robert. We pray for Janet, Carol, and Al, Norlin and Dave, and Irv, for Pamela, Joan and Jeff, and Amanda and Lily. We pray for the Williams family and the Horner family who are experiencing losses in their families. We pray for Tom who's going through treatments and for Sherry who's recovering from a fall. Light of the word, world, where we encounter darkness, shame, and depression, bring us your healing light and help us to be an example of your light and promise in the world. Help us advocate for those who live in the dark places, the hard places, the places where we would rather not go, but where others have been banished to. We know that you went to the darkest of all places to care for us and save us from shame, to show us that we deserve to live in hope. God who wept as we ourselves weep, you know personally what it is to encounter great sadness and grief. Give us the strength to endure through the sadness, however long it lasts, and to hold on to the knowledge that joy comes with the morning even if the morning seems to be ages away. Creator God, allow each of us in your wisdom and mercy to put others before ourselves, following your example to support others before we seek support for ourselves, to understand others and their ideas and opinions, before we insist on our own ways of being understood, and to love others as you love them before we demand to be loved ourselves. Lord God, we lift these prayers up to you, knowing that in giving to others we are also blessed, in forgiving others we are also set free, and that in devoting our hearts and lives to you, that we are given a new life and purpose and the promise of eternal life. We pray these things and those weighing heavy on our hearts and minds, using the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Good morning. My name is Liz Miller, and I've been asked to talk a little bit about something that is near and dear to my heart. 
I've been a member of this church for over 20 years and been involved in a lot of different aspects of the church, but the thing that gives me the most fulfillment and joy is my role in Agape. And for those of you that may be visitors or new to the church, Agape is a mission um, run by this church, led by our youth, which has been going on for over 20 years. It, many of you were probably involved at some point. Um, I've been involved um, for the last six years or so, and I'm one of the lead coordinators for Agape. So what is Agape? Agape is a community kitchen that is run out of um, the First Presbyterian Church in Elizabeth. It's led by our youth with a lot of volunteer, um, adult volunteers that help behind the scenes. And we serve between 80 to 100 guests per week, every Wednesday night. They get a chance to come inside to a cooler environment for about 45 minutes, sit down and have a homemade meal, have a little bit of um, fellowship with other people in a safe and secure environment. And for these people, that can be a big deal. Many of them have mental illness, they have disabilities, they have addictions, but then there are some that just aren't able to stretch their paycheck that far for whatever reason. So it's, it gives them an opportunity to, have, um, to fill their bellies, to have a meal. So one of the things that we do at Agape, and we also do throughout our high school mission trips and our middle school mission trips, is we talk about where did I see God? And it's a, it's a nice thing to do at the end of the evening um, it makes people, I think, it brings us all to, together on the same page. And I just wanted to share a couple things with you around that. Um, over the years, where have I seen God at Agape? Well, I've seen God in the volunteers, Pastor Sarah and William, um, who is a, an adult volunteer, but also is the property manager at the church where we hold this. They, one night I saw them sit with a man who was openly weeping. Uh, he had newly become homeless. He had some other issues. He was trying to find a place to get canned goods. He wanted to get a job. And he was just so overcome with emotion. And I saw them sitting with him and counsel, trying to counsel and help him in any way that they could. Uh, another way that I saw God was through a few of the guests that had come and were getting a, a, a meal. And they were so overcome with the service that we were providing that they wanted to give back. William runs a lunch program on Fridays, and they ended up coming and volunteering with William. That was their way to give back, which was wonderful. And then, of course, the youth. As I mentioned, the youth, uh, this is a program that is led by the youth, and um, we've been lucky to have so many youth involved over the years. Uh, ben Cummings was our intern this summer. He did an amazing job. And, uh, Cooper's Andrew, um, Cooper Andrews, uh, was the intern throughout the last two years. He's now off at college. And then we also have Andrew Crawford, who will be starting in the fall. Um, it's a great way for the youth to get involved, to give back, and to learn something about their, themselves and their community. Um, so I stand up here asking for volunteers, because with any, you know, any program, we always, we always need help. Fall is a great time to think about restarting things. Um, I know everyone is busy. I, I run a small business. I'm lucky because I have flexibility and I'm able to dedicate three, usually three times a month to helping out at Agape. We're all very busy people. But if you, if you're, if you are drawn to a mission, if you're drawn to helping others, this is a great opportunity. It's not a huge commitment. And we welcome, this is intergenerational uh, volunteer opportunity. So someone of any age is welcome to help out. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll be in the Northex afterwards. If you want to speak to me about it and just understand more about it, I'd, be, I'd love to talk to you. Thank you very much. We'll uh, receive the offering in a minute. Um, so about 10 years ago, around 10 years ago, many years ago, I was sitting in the South Orange Diner, the one under the train tracks by the South Orange train station with my family. And um, this song, uh, The Waters of March by Antonio Carlos Jobim came onto the sound system. Jobim was the founder really of Bossa Nova. You might probably heard the girl from Ipanema at some point in your lives. Um, so I heard that song and I thought, you know, it would be really interesting to set a sacred text to that tune. And it starts out like this. And that sounded like raindrops. So over time, what that yielded 
was Bossa Nova Noah. And um, this is kind of a retelling of the Noah story, uh, a little bit through, through what I imagine Noah or a person that was sort of put upon to, um, or invited, if we should say, to uh, do a great thing, but not really be sure how he might handle that. So um, thank you very much. A drip, a drop, God said it would rain. The people said no when they had more champagne. But Noah said yes, so he built and he built. And he measured and built until there was an ark. Then he went to the hills and he went to the seas. And he went to the trees and he found twos, not threes. Of all birds and all bees and he found two gnus. And two owls who said who and two horses and cow. And he said don't know how we all live stern to bow when the weather gets that's bad. And he looked at the sky, and he got a bit sad. And he looked at his kids, and he thought of his wife, and their small little life in the world filled with strife. And he looked out for God, and God had Noah's back. It rained and rained, when will this ever end? Then the going got tough, and the tough got afraid. It's getting scary in here, I could sure use a friend. Just to help pass the time, maybe share a good rhyme. God, I hope you're still there, I should just go to bed. Noah woke with the rain, then one day it was done, and the rainbow appeared, and the stars shone at night. Then they sent out a dove, and it brought back a twig, and then Noah said, yay, they all said, thank the Lord. Noah felt something new, said, what's this, what I feel, am I some kind of dope? No, what I'm feeling is hope, that our people can care, that our people can share, and we'll love everyone, whatever color their hair. Noah looked out for God in the breeze in the trees, in the sun on his knees, and he said, thank the Lord for trusting in me, simple little old me. Do you think we'll become more than we used to be? Noah looked, there was God, and God smiled, looking glad. Noah said, what a day, and God said, you're okay. Thank you, God, for all that you've given us. Please bless these gifts and our entire lives to your service. Our last hymn is number 439, O oh My Soul, Bless Your Redeemer.
prayer as we, as we leave this building today is that we go into our little parts of the world secure in the knowledge that God is everywhere and always with us. And we ask God, that you help us to always remember your greatest commandments, to love God and to love our neighbors. Peace be with you.